Okay, let's go for another video on the books on the Second Seminole War. The first video I did, the sound didn't come out as great, and so I just wanted to redo it. I guess when everything's compressed and sent to YouTube, it doesn't turn out as well. Anyway, since the Second Seminole War was 180 years ago, the best thing we can do from hearing from people who are in the war is go to the writings. That's all we have left. And that's as close as we'll ever get to actually hearing their voices from what they wrote. And people back then were very literate and very good at writing. Uh, and sometimes it's a little difficult to read the style and the grammar. But one thing we have to remember is that people have bias and perspectives and different points of view that we just need to keep in mind when reading it. So, you know, just as people are the same way today, nothing's changed. Uh, some people ask about the native point of view. Now there is uh, some very articulate Creeks like George Stiggins and Thomas Woodward who wrote their uh, memoirs or in usually a series of letters that were published in the newspaper. And, uh, you know, Stiggins, I don't know if that's in print anymore. Thomas Woodward I'll mention later. So there are a few in print. Another thing is not all the white men were hostile to the natives. Some were very sympathetic and would print what they said word for word. Uh, John T. Sprague is one of those. Another thing we have to remember is that even if we read an account, we must not take it for gospel and saying that's exactly what happened. Uh, for example, the one of the battles, the uh, Battle of Withlacoochee, there's about six different eyewitness accounts of the battle, and they might as well be describing a different battle altogether. Uh, they're very different on what they're describing. It all depends on who was in the battle, what was their job or what was their mission in the battle uh, and what they were seeing. Were they describing the battle from close at hand or were they very far off? Or were they writing about the battle and they weren't there at all? That's one thing we have to keep in mind if it's second or third hand information. Uh, many of the eyewitness accounts from the Seminole War uh, started coming out in the 1960s, and then they went out of print, but the Seminole Wars Foundation has got a lot of these books back into print, and if they do have them available, I'll put the link down below where you can go to the website and order the books. A lot of eyewitness accounts ended up in journals, like the Florida Historical Quarterly. One of the early issues had a four-part series of I uh, think it is a Surgeon Phelps and a Lieutenant Forey. I'm not sure if I got the name right in the very early issues. A uh, very good eyewitness account. Uh, one of them mentions how they're planning on capturing Osceola, and this was a day before it happened. So you can tell from that that the soldiers planned on capturing Osceola right off the bat. Um, there's another account in the Florida Historical Quarterly from a 1930 issue, the son of Willoughby Tillis, the Battle of Tillis Farm in 1856 during the Third Seminole War. His son is describing the battle. It's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, written down and recorded uh, years earlier, about you know about 1908, so about 50 years after the battle, when he was still alive. So that's a very valuable resource. The people who are interviewed who are still alive who are eyewitnesses. There's another journal, uh, Bartholomew Lynch, and that's a dissertation uh, done through Florida State University back in 1965. And I had to read it through interlibrary loan. And that's a very interesting account because he was a very articulate and literate soldier, but he was a dragoon soldier. And the second dragoons he is in were very brutal on what it uh, 
how it treated the soldiers. And he describes some of the brutality. So it's actually a very uh, valuable eyewitness. Unfortunately, it's not published. And I would love to be able to edit a republishing of that and publish it into a book. Now, some a lot of the accounts were written at the beginning of the Second Seminole War in 1836. One of them was by Captain James Barr, and it's not in print since, except you can order a reprint now. I got, I think I got this for a few dollars through Amazon, uh, a correct and authentic narrative of the Indian War in Florida. <clears throat> Captain Barr, he had his uh, beard shot off during the war and close shave is what they called it in the newspaper at the time. And so this is a very short account. Um, and I don't think he was in much of the war, but what's really good is it has a very good account of Dade's battle. I think he got that from R Ramson Clark himself. And that's something I found recently. One of the first books that was an eyewitness account was uh, John Bemrose. Reminiscence of the Second Seminole War. Dr. John Mann edited it back in 1966. I believe it was this, the old copy. The Seminole War Foundation is now reprinted, so it has a red cover. So just don't go by the covers I have because uh, the covers have ch changed and I just never bought a more recent printing of them. In the 1960s and 70s, the state of Florida uh, started printing what they called the facsimile series, which were reprints of historical books. This one, which was, uh, I think he's a militia officer, M.M. Cohen in the Second Seminole War. It's uh, Notices of the Florida Campaign, printed in 1836. Fortunately, the Seminole War Foundation has now reprinted that, and that's good because that's a very valuable account. He tells about the blockhouse, Holloman's blockhouse under siege. Um, and most of these accounts cover Gaines's siege and battle on the Withlacoochee. Um, there's a lot of officers there that wrote their accounts. This one that came out just a few years ago the Florida Historical Quarterly in 2004 printed the diary and letters of James Anderson of the 2nd Infantry to his wife. Um, so her name was, maiden name was Brown. She was from Noonansville. So he is writing to her in Noonansville. And it was published in a book, Echoes from a Distant Frontier, the Brown Sisters Correspondence from Annabelle in Florida. Of course, it includes more than the Seminole War, but uh, this is ed edited by James Denham, and I've actually seen him speak a few times. He's very entertaining, and Keith Honeycutt, and that's a little expensive. I actually found this one in the uh, gift shop at the State History Museum in Tallahassee. This next book is one I had to special order. I and we kind of stumbled upon from uh, by accident. Daniel P. Whiting was an officer in the 7th Regiment Infantry during the Second Seminole War. And then he went out west and was in the Civil War. There's a uh, first chapter or two covers the Second Seminole War when he was at Fort Number 3 near Cedar Key and also at Micanopy. Uh, memoir of 30 Years of Soldiering by Murphy Gibbons, A Soldier's Life, Daniel P. Whiting. Now this is really interesting also if you want to include Indian territory out in Oklahoma. He was the last officer to abandon Fort Tosin in southeast Oklahoma. Now, I've actually been there before and uh, the day before he was supposed to leave a real powerful tornado came and tore up all the buildings in the post and the barracks and the kitchen and all the beautifully constructed buildings so they can never reoccupy and uh, uh, come back to the fort ever again. So that's why if you go there today, there's just one small building. This book is Amidst a Storm of Bullets, 
the Diary of Henry Prince in Florida, 1836 to 1842, edited by Frank Walmer and John Mann. This came out about 2000. Uh, I believe it has a different cover now. It's a different Jackson Walker painting that includes Gaines Camp on the Withlacoochee. Now, the neat story behind this is back in the 1980s, the family that had this book in their attic, in a trunk in their attic, found it and brought it down to Dade Battlefield. And, you know, with uh, some negotiating, eventually Am donated it to the university, either Tampa University or FSU, uh, whichever. And what's interesting is from this, archaeologists were able to find the camp or the hideout of Osceola on the Withlacoochee River that had stayed hidden for 150 years. There's a captain in the Second Seminole War, George McCall. I think he is in the 4th Infantry, also in the Ford Effect Simile series printed about 1974. This has not been reprinted since, but it's very valuable because it includes his time in Florida in the 1820s. He uh, talk, talks about things like going out and he's wanting to uh, shoot an alligator and remove the tooth that he can use for a powder measure for his pistol in there, which is a bit humorous. So a lot of good information from the 1820s and then the 30s. Then he goes out into Indian territory and meets some of the Indians that he had known in Florida, like Micanopy out in Oklahoma. So it's very interesting. But it's a long read as you saw how thick it was. And a few years ago, uh, another book, it's edited by John and Mary Lou. It's the journal of Colonel William Foster, miserable pride of a soldier. Foster was um, I think he was in the 4th Infantry, can't remember. He was at the Battle of Withlacoochee, the first one. He was also at the, um, uh, was it the Battle of Okeechobee. Uh, so it covers some good information. Most, most all the information is here. Is Foster is writing letters to his wife and complaining that he's been passed up for promotion a number of years. But he was a very important character in the Second Seminole War. Of course, Fort Foster is named after him. A uh, recent book that came out, and John and Mary Lou have been doing a lot of work. And this is probably the one they were the most ambitious on uh, researching. It's the uh, life and writings of Major John Rogers Vinson, 1801 to 1847. The Army is My Calling. And not only his letters, but about him, his family. He was the, I think the first graduate of West Point that was from Rhode Island. He's buried in Providence, Rhode Island. And right on top of his tomb is the eight inch cannonball that took off his head during the Mexican War. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> Up there, he, his uh, family was uh, very famous in the military. Uh, they also built a church with stained glass windows of some of the family members at the time. So he has a stained glass window in the family church. John and Mary Lou went through about 5,000 letters uh, to research uh, uh, Captain Vinton. So that's a real good addition we have to our Seminole War history. I don't know if this has been reprinted yet. I know it went out of print. It might be back in print again. I just have a copy that I bought about 40 years ago, Journey into Wilderness. It's the uh, journal of surgeon Jacob Ma. He was a uh, doctor from Charleston, South Carolina. He went to Harvard University. And there's actually another book out. It's kind of scarce, but I got a copy. It's his or writings as a student from Harvard really doesn't cover the Second Seminole War, but I found out one of his best friends in Harvard is a relative of mine who was a cousin of one of my direct relatives. So that was really cool finding that out. But Jacob Mott, he was in the Creek War, and then he went down uh, the east coast of Florida at the same time as Taylor's campaign. And 
He may have been in the Battle of Waxahachie, I can't remember. Uh, been a while since I read it, but the best thing about this, even though it was written in 1966, in the back, it has a real extensive uh, appendix and notes about the Seminole War, researching everybody that he mentions and every place. So that's almost as valuable as the diary itself. Another diary that was really scarce and unknown for a long time, it was uh, printed in a small facsimile printing in the 60s in South Carolina because that's where he's from. It was The War in Florida by Woodburn Potter. And originally he published it anonymous because he said some things critical about the army leadership. And so he didn't want to give out his name, but of course we know it now. And the enhanced edition edited by John and Mary Lou Missel has now been published by the Seminole War Foundation. And the nice thing about that is that this has an index. The original facsimile book did not. And that's very valuable. Uh, he was also another um, eyewitness at the uh, Battle of Withlacoochee with Gaines. So that that's pretty cool. Um, this next book, um, it can probably be considered an eyewitness because it was published when there was still eyewitnesses of the war and has some valuable information. It's a book on the Sef Second Cavalry Regiment, which is what the Second Dragoons became. It's from Everglades to Canyon with the Second United States Cavalry by uh, Colonel Theophilus Rodenberg. Uh, this is a reprint that I got. The University of Oklahoma was did the reprint which is good because I always wanted a copy. I saw the original printed in 1875, but it was going for about $8,000 in an antique bookstore that, that I saw. So when it came out with a reprint, then I went for it. Uh, it has a lot on the characters and the battles and the events of the Second Seminole War when the Second Dragoon Regiment was created in 1836. So it has some valuable information you might not find anywhere else. This was really the last book that we had printed by one of the officers or eyewitnesses of the Second Seminole War in 1836, the year that a lot of the Seminole War eyewitness books came out. This just came out at the end of 2019. It's uh, William W. Smith was the officer sketch of the Seminole War and sketches during a campaign. It's a little hard to follow and I can see why it was the last one. It's the last book that Frank Lomer worked on before he passed away, edited and enhanced by Debbie Harper. Uh, so really glad to have this because I had a real bad photocopied one originally. And I have talked about this earlier, but this is going to be an eyewitness account. This is um, John T. Sprague, uh, the Florida War. It's originally it had a longer name, The Origin, Progress, and Conclusion of the Florida War, published in 1848. He was the adjutant or the record keeper, uh, handled all the correspondence for Colonel William Worth. And so he takes some of the direct army reports and correspondence and just prints them verbatim. He's very uh, sympathetic to the Seminoles, knew him personally, reprinted some speeches at Kawakichi or Wildcat word for word, and that's the only way we have these. So that's really great on that. Now Worth, he married his colonel's daughter, um, Mary, I think, or maybe that was Worth's wife. Um, anyway, so he married the colonel's daughter, and when the colonel passed away, the mother-in-law moved in. And that was when he was commander at the, uh, or actually back up. Yeah, that was right after the Mexican War, or maybe it was right before. I think I saw a newspaper article he married Wirtha's daughter in 43, right after the Second Seminole War. And Worth was st still commanding in Florida at that time. 
up until the Mexican War. Then Colonel Worth died, I think it was in 1849, and he's buried in Brooklyn, New York, where he's from originally. Uh, Colonel Worth's daughter that Sprague had buried, married, and Colonel Worth's wife moved in with her daughter and son-in-law into their home in St. Augustine when Sprague was uh, in charge of reconstruction in Florida after the Civil War. And he was in the commanding officer's quarters in St. Augustine, which is actually still standing. And it's the commanding officer's quarters today, which I think is really cool uh, at the National Guard uh, barracks at St. Francis, where the uh, military cemetery is, where uh, Mrs. Worth and her daughters, Sprague, they're both buried there. Interesting that John T. Sprague and his wife had a daughter who married one of the Dade family. So they're married into the Dade family that came from Hopkinsville, Kentucky. And in fact, I talked to one of their descendants or relatives uh, from that branch of the Dade family. It's kind of a distant cousin from Major Dade. And uh, anyway, I've been going over some genealogy and family correspondence with them. Uh, recently, not not talking to them, of course, just you know because their letters crossed Major Dade in the 1830s. Okay, bear with me. I just have a few more. Uh, another one in the facsimile series. It's not reprinted yet, but it's been very easy to find. Dr. Andrew Welch, Osceola Nikanichi, or Osceola. Nikonochi, uh, maybe a cousin of Osceola. He's a little boy about five or six years old that was captured by the militia, I believe around Jacksonville. And the doctor was his ward, took care of him, took him back to England and have, had him educated in a sc school in England. And anyway, don't want to give away the whole story. And then the doctor also took care of another woman who was scalped by Indians and lived to tell about it. Her name was Mrs. Uh, Jane Johns. And he wrote a book about her to raise money for her, uh, I guess, for her welfare. She had no way to earn a living otherwise. One of the books in the facsimile series that was a hard time to get a hold of it was uh, John Lee Williams, The Territory of Florida, originally printed in 1837. Really good book about Florida territory because he was from St. Augustine and he wrote some real good information on the Florida militia. But it's now back in print with the Seminole Wars Foundation that's also put it back in print and I'm glad, glad they've done that because it's, uh, he gives a very account, inter interesting, valuable account. For example, in the 1820s, he's sailing all around Florida, trying to get some surveying or some legal descriptions of Florida. And he's writing this book to, as an advertisement, really, to get people to come down in Florida. And one of the accounts, he goes up the Caloosahatchee River and goes up the Peace River and describes Indian villages there that are in the 1820s. Really valuable account. And, uh, you know, what else? The, the Army Navy Chronicle was the trade magazine printed from 1835 to 1844. And it's about 6,600 pages or 6,600 pages of material that I've gone through every one that I could find, uh, any surviving issue. And I did a Seminole War guide of where all the Seminole War articles are in the Army and Navy Chronicle. And I have a link down the description. Uh, for example, there's five descriptions of the Battle of Withlacoochee, but they're scattered throughout the issues. So the only way you could find them is by me making this index or making this guide an indexing and telling them where there were. Also, after Colonel Harney's trading post was attacked by Billy Bullegs and the Spanish Indians and Seminoles in 1839, 
There's another interesting account that was almost forgotten, written by a soldier who was captured by the Indians and taken over to Lake Okeechobee, and he eventually escaped and made his way back to the Army. That, that account is in the Army-Navy Chronicle, but it's in the last year it was printed in 1844, and so it's really interesting to know. Of course, uh, there may be some other accounts that I forgot to mention. One I'd like to mention is Thomas Woodward. He was a Creek Indian, or I guess his father was Creek, his mother was not. And so some people called him a Creek and some people did not, but he was very literate. He was with the Creek Ar Army under uh, McIntosh that came to Florida during the First Seminole War. And unfortunately, he's he uh, took advantage in the 1830s with the Creek land speculation, I guess just some people profited from, but he wrote a very uh, good account of the Creek War, the early Seminole War, talked about David Moniak and Osceola. I don't have a copy of the book, but I have it in the description down below. It's been published as a book, a little hard to get, but it's also been on the internet for about 25 years. So you can read it directly off the internet. And that's one reason why I don't have a copy of the book. Thomas Woodward's, it's uh, Woodward's Reminiscence. And uh, the problem with the internet, it's not indexed. It's just the short articles and letters you have to go through it. One interesting thing is he knew Osceola's family and could tell you where Osceola was born. He says, oh yeah, it was on their side of the railroad tracks that are there today in Tallahassee, Alabama. So he's a very valuable eyewitness account. Okay, well, I didn't go with the virtual background today because the books would reflect off of that and create havoc. But I hope you enjoyed my description of various different eyewitness accounts that are available for the Second Seminole War.